The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, I'm building a custom computer rig for AMD, based off their new Trinity line of APUs. This PC will also have the ability to launch model rockets, as per their request. This build will give us a chance to talk about a couple of electronic devices we haven't covered before. Let's get started. But first, the news. In Ben news, I'd like to tell you about some other projects I'm going to be doing for AMD. They want computers put into a variety of objects, including a payphone, and I'm going to make that into a Skype computer. Hello, I'm on Skype, another payphone. As well as putting one inside this traffic light. I thought this might be cool because we can have the traffic light light up briefly to tell you if you have an email or, or Twitter message. So yeah, I'm going to see some cool things that I can put uh, computers inside of and uh, probably see them on my site in the future. The first computer that I'm building for AMD is a rocket launching computer. A computer that launches model rockets. Here are the parts that are going to be used to make it. We have a front panel here along with our timer display and power button. Here's the main assembly, which has our MSI small motherboard, the AMD uh, Trinity chipset for the APU, solid state hard drive, and in the back, this is where the rocket launch tubes go, like that. So there's two you can select from. I haven't painted this yet, but these are the um, hatches. Hatches are on servos, so they're, they open up as part of the show. Here's our cool launch panel. You can select which rocket you want to launch, also manual or automatic hatch control, and of course, the timer start button. So what I want to go over in more detail in this episode are some of the circuits I made for the control panel here. It has a circuit board as you can see. Specifically, MOSFETs, which are high power controllers that will actually ignite the rockets and the LED display, talking about how to wire one of those up with a microcontroller. So we're gonna go over those two parts of this build and then we'll come back to this, finish assembling it, and then demonstrate it. Let's start with the rocket launching control. We're going to be using a MOSFET, which is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. MOSFETs are great for controlling high powered loads using lower powered logic level devices. This is the electrical drawing of a MOSFET. We have our 12 volts coming in here, and that's going to feed into the rocket igniting element right here. And that goes into the drain of the MOSFET. Down here we have the source, which goes to ground. Sounds backwards, but that's just how it works. Here's the gate. This is what actually controls it. The gate is normally pulled down low to ground, so the gate won't accidentally fire. But then when we apply 5 volts to the gate, it activates the MOSFET, allowing the current to flow through it. In this case, igniting our rocket igniter and sending our rocket to the moon, but probably not quite that far. I'm gonna wire up an example now so you can see how the MOSFET works and how it'll fire an ignition primer for our rockets. So here's what I'm doing. You're gonna have power coming off of this power supply. The yellow is the 12 volts. That's going to go to the ignition thing for the rocket. I'm not sure what it's actually called. That's hooks up here. If the MOSFET is triggered by five volts being applied to this line, it will allow the current to pass through the yellow wires, thus firing the igniter. So the power supply is running. We have 12 volts going to our igniter, the other end of the igniter going to the MOSFET, the other end of the MOSFET going to ground. So when I apply 5 volts to the MOSFET, the MOSFET will activate, allowing the high current to pass through this, and that would have ignited the rocket. So let's see if this works. Smells good, doesn't it? <laughs> so to recap on the MOSFET, you have your load here on the center pin, which was our igniter. Ground is over on the right-hand pin, and the left-hand pin is your logic level activation for the MOSFET, which allowed us to trigger this. So we know that a PC power supply will easily fire one of these rockets. Here's the seven segment display that I want to use for this project. 
and it has three digits. Now, it doesn't have a wire for every digit because that would take up a lot of wires and a lot of your I.O. What it does is it has um, seven connectors. See the ones I've lifted up? These are for the seven segments, uh, eight actually, including the decimal point. And then there's three for the common anode, which is the power coming in. So here's how you actually drive it. I will hook up ground to one of these segments, and then I'll tap positive voltage on this. So when this pin has positive voltage, you see something on segment one, segment two, and segment three. So how the display actually works is by rapidly selecting which segment is active, they all appear to be on. And the advantage of that is, you know, you don't use up as much uh, I.O. because you just have to run eight lines for the digits and then just three more lines to select which digit. Instead of, you know, eight times three, which would be 24, you're looking at like 11. Are you an engineer? Do you like getting your hands on the latest technology? Do you like free stuff? Then you should head over to the Element 14 site so you can check out the road test program where they'll send you free product in exchange for your feedback. Here's how it works. Start by visiting element14.com to log in or register for free. You can also access road tests at any time by visiting element14.com forward slash road test. Here you'll find information on all the current products available to their road testers in a simple enrollment form. And be sure to tell them why you'd be a great road tester for that product. You can enroll in as many road tests as you like. There's no limit to the number of products you can test. If you're selected to be a tester, your free products will be shipped right to your door. The new equipment is 100% yours to keep. No contracts, returns, or purchases necessary. After you've become an expert with your new e-gear, head back to the element14.com community and let everyone know what you think. Sounds like a sweet deal to me. Go to element14.com forward slash road test to enroll today. Now, back to the show. Here's our LED display attached to a breadboard. Now this circuit here that's buried under the wires is a shift register, uh, 74HC595. It's very useful using three lines, data, clock, and latch. You can shift in as much data as you want into the shift register or a series of shift registers because you can put them in, in series and uh, use that to output stuff. So three lines or three IO lines on your microcontroller can net you, you know, 64 outputs or even more, just depending on how much time you want to spend shifting it. So we're using the eight lines on the shift register to act as the eight digit grounds. And then to select which digit is active, we have these three black lines here. These are the anodes. So when you go 111, 111, 111, you cycle it very quickly and it changes which digit is on. So by changing what's in the shift register and synchronizing it with which column is active, you can create a display. I'll show it to you in slow motion first so it'll make more sense. Here's a circuit running very slowly. One digit is on at a time and the value inside the shift register changes along with the column enable. Do, 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 do. So we're actually doing this with just six I.O. lines. Data, clock, latch, and then three for the um, column select. We could, you know, simplify it even more. The great thing about this is with more shift registers, you could have like 10 of these and it would still use the same amount of I.O. because we're using serial instead of parallel. Serial takes longer because you have to stream out one bit at a time instead of like eight bits at a time. However, Modern microcontrollers tend to have more speed than they do I.O., so it's more beneficial to do things serial whenever you can, because that way you have more I.O. I'm going to speed this up, and then you'll see it start to uh, look more like a display. So 100 milliseconds per column. Okay. And then in order to uh, not appear to be flickering to the human eye, you need about 100 hertz. So I'm going to bump it up to 1,000. Uh, that's 1,000 per digit, so the duty cycle will be 300, so this will be 300 hertz. So as you can see, it appears to be fully on. You may notice sometimes digits like these appear to flicker when they're recorded on TV or, or video. Uh, that's because sometimes the refresh rate of the camera kind of tends to get in sync or out of sync with the display, and then you can actually see it. Like the camera, even though it's only recording 30 frames a second, it kind of catches the edge of the transition, and then you can see with your eyes. So if you're some sort of robot from the future, you know, you would see this flickering, but humans can't see much past 100 hertz. That's why if you have one of those 3D TVs with the shutter glasses, they do 120, I'm sorry, they do 240 hertz total, so they can have 120 hertz per eye, for the left and right separation, and it's still beyond what you can see flickering. If it was 60 frames per eye, you would start to notice it. You can see it in video games too. Uh, you can definitely tell the difference between a 30 frames per second video game and a 60 frames per second game. 
But yeah, that's the basic uh, way to hook up an LED using multiplexing. Here are those circuits being used in a rocket computer project. We have our LED display here, and then we also have another shift register that lights up these indicator lights here. On the back, we have our two MOSFETs for launching either of the rockets. And we have a power input from the computer, some power supply, which will give us five volts and 12 volts. We have a servo hookup, as well as our control panel hookup here. So we're gonna bolt this up and start assembling this rocket computer. Well, time to go to the moon. Here's our nearly completed rocket launching computer. So we're going to take it outside, turn it on, you know, log into Windows, and then launch some rockets. So the MOSFETs will trigger the rockets, and our countdown timer will tell us we've got about 10 seconds before they go. And we've also got these servo-controlled hatches that will open automatically for us. Or you can set them to manual. I'll probably set them to manual just to be safe. Engage. Eight, contact with a test one. Seven, six, five. Okay, four, we checked all four systems. Three, and there you go. Two, modulation all four. One. And King was a go. Roger, you're locked. We're here also. My rave today is not really a rave, more of a follow-up. After complaining about it, I did see The Hobbit in 3D high frame rate, and it actually looked pretty cool. If anything, the 3D part was bothersome as I developed a headache about halfway through, which brings me to my rant. My rant today is that movies are too dang long. I remember a time when they'd introduce a character like Indiana Jones. He'd fight the bad guys, get the girl, and save the world all within an hour and 45 minutes. But nowadays, even romantic comedies go past two hours, and big epic films routinely push three. Why? My conspiracy theory is that because most films are digitally projected these days, there's less incentive to keep a movie short because they're not making actual expensive film prints of it they have to ship around. That's expensive. Today's question comes from Guillerme, who asks, I would like to drive an LCD with a PIC microcontroller. I would like to have the same resolution as a 128 by 32 pinball dot matrix display, but on an LCD. Okay, I'd suggest Googling PIC VGA circuit. I know people have done it. They've gotten a PIC to run a VGA circuit. Then to make the dots, you should check out Color DMD for inspiration. They actually make pinball displays on VGA. And then finally, to get the graphics on the thing, consider using an SD card and file system. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to build a slot-loading, truly zero-insertion force Nintendo Entertainment System. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.